On May the 6th, 1937, I wasn't quite born yet, in case you're wondering, there was a radio commentator named Herbert Morrison set at the Naval Air Burst in Lakehurst, New Jersey, waiting for the arrival of the largest airship to have ever flown in that day, the Zeppelin Hindenburg. 1,000 spectators gathered with Morrison to see the mighty ship, the symbol of advancement and man's ingenuity. Indeed, a display of humanity steering its, his own way, free and independent with the absence of God. As the ship, which was 12 hours late, finally came into view, Herbert Morrison, again the commentator, made his comments on the radio and he said, Toward us, like a great feather, is the Hindenburg. The members of the crew were looking down on the field ahead, uh, of getting their glimpses of the, of the mass of people that were there. Suddenly, 300 feet above the landing area, the Hindenburg burst into flames. In exactly 32 seconds, the ship was destroyed, killing 13 passengers and 22 crew members. Resonating with the impact of the disaster of Morrison's words in his breathless account, Oh, the humanity. In those 32 seconds, what was supposed to be the symbol of German grandeur and human advancement became the expression of the... Uh, frailty of human life. So this, of all mornings that we come to celebrate, we may look at our sin, we may look at the trouble and the tragedy that comes with life, but this morning as we look at what we celebrate today, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we can look and say, okay, because He lives, I can face tomorrow. We look this morning not at our Weakness. We don't look at even our sin this morning other than the fact that we need to repent and turn away from it. But with this morning we look and we celebrate the fact that our Savior reigns. That He is awesome. That He was not just a human put in the ground, but He was deity in the flesh. We have behind the preacher in this church in the baptistry a big cross. The reason that cross is there, as far as I'm concerned, it's been there longer than I've been here. But as far as I'm concerned, it's, it's there so that you don't look so much at the speaker, but you think of the cross and what Jesus done on the cross for you. And I hope that's the case this morning. So what if this morning, as we look into Scripture, as we look at what Jesus did for us, and we think of the subject, Behold the Man, what if we would let God's Word penetrate our hearts and we wouldn't just go through the steps of being here on Easter morning that, okay, it's Easter, I need to be in church, that's great, you do every Sunday, by the way, but that's beside the point. But what if we actually let God's Word penetrate our hearts and changed us this morning? What a great day that will be. So we think this morning, not just the death of the humanity of Jesus as we looked at on Friday, but the resurrected life of God in the flesh. And as for us, we can think of a plague that killed millions. We can think of a cancer patient losing the hard-fought battle the teenager in the prime of life who loses his or her life in a car accident. A twin brother that has suffered for 51 years. All reveal that we are not the towering pillars of strength that sometimes we believe we are. We often ignore our own frailty, refusing to recognize it for what it is. Even worse, when we do see our weakness, we can often provide no reason, no answer, and no cure for it. But our God answers it, not only by defining its cause, which is sin, but by offering the cure. So the question this morning, why do I struggle with so many things in this world? The answer, the cure to the cause of the weakness of man that I want to direct your attention to this morning. The answer is not in the form of some impersonal it, but the personal who. The answer to that question is Jesus. Will you stick with me just for a few minutes this morning while we look at Jesus and we behold the man Christ Jesus as we look upon him? First of all, I want us to look at, I want us to behold the man at his trials. If you're at John chapter 19, we'll start reading at verse 1. I'm going to ask you just at this first reading, if you would stand in reverence of God's holy word, if you're willing and able, please. Behold the man at his trial. Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. 
And the, and the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and a purple robe on him. And they began to come up to him and say, Hail, King of the Jews! And gave him slaps in the face. Yeah, this is God in the flesh they are doing this to, folks. Pilate came out again and said to them, Behold, I am bringing him out to you so that you may know that I find no guilt in him. Jesus then came out, wearing the crown of thorns and a purple robe, Pilate said to them, listen, behold the man. You know what Pilate's words was? Behold the man. Look upon him. Here is the one. So when the chief priests and officers saw him, they cried out saying, crucify, crucify. Pilate said to them, take him yourselves and crucify him again for the second time, for I find no guilt in him. Then Jesus answered him, Excuse me. Then Jews answered him and said, We have a law, and by that law he ought to die because he made himself out to be the Son of God. Wow. Wow. Behold the man at his trial. Let's pray again. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the season of Easter that we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord. Father, we thank you for Jesus who died for us and who rose again for us, giving us life giving us eternal life. Lord, I pray that you would speak to our hearts today through your word in Christ's name. Amen. I want you to notice, you may be seated, I want you to notice that even evil Pilate could not find any fault in the man Christ Jesus. He uttered it twice in the, in the passage that we looked at. He could find no fault in him. He could not say that if you and I were standing there. Did you know that? You'd say, well, I'm not guilty of murder or anything horrendous like that. Well, the Bible tells us that if we've hated someone, we are guilty of murder. The Bible says if we've lusted after someone, we're guilty of adultery. So we have all broken God's law. Therefore, if we were standing there in the place of Jesus, he couldn't say, I find no fault in this man or woman. But with Jesus, he could say that. There was no sin in Jesus. The chief priest wanted him dead. Notice that they, they could not settle for just uh, beating him. They couldn't settle for a fine or just jail time. They wanted Jesus dead. Incidentally, the same thing God the Father wanted, but for different reasons. The book of Isaiah tells us that it pleased God to crush him Please the Father to crush the Son. Because he just enjoyed, no, 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 because he knew that was the only way for us, mankind, to get to him. The chief priest wanted him dead. Jesus threatened their power. He threatened their, their money, their influence, and they wanted him gone. But make no mistake about it. There was one that was the center of attention that day. His name was Jesus. Yes, uh, there was others on trial. There was others that died, but Jesus was the center of attention that day for the chief priest, for Pilate, and for the uh, disciples and many others. Killing Jesus, they thought they were rid of their problem. Th they thought that it would be over if we can just get rid of this man. But on the third day, they realized their problem had just began. <laughs> They realized that Jesus had victory. They realized that death could not hold him. They realized their plot was weak. They realized for them there was no hope. But for mankind, we know that through the resurrection there was hope for us. Wow. When we approach the trial of Jesus, when we behold him being mocked, ridiculed, abused, we should remember that all of that was part of Jesus' work to redeem us. Listen, nothing was wasted. Everything was necessary. The Bible says that he was the payment or the propitiation for our sins. What's our response to such an awesome gift? There's only one. There's only one, our whole self. To repent of our sins and give him our whole self and to faithfully serve him with everything that we possibly can. Behold the man at his trial, but also behold the man on the cross. Skip with me, it's John 19 again, but skip with me down to verse 16. So they, then he handed him, 
over to them to be crucified. They took Jesus, therefore, he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of the skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha. And they crucified him with two other men, one on either side and Jesus in between. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. And it was written, Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. Therefore many of the Jews read this inscription for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And it was written in Hebrew, Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priest and the Jews were saying to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but that he said, I am King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. Then the soldiers, when they crucified Jesus, took his outer garments, made four parts, a part for every soldier, and also the tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it, to decide whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture. They divided my outer garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Therefore the soldiers did these things. But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. Then Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, and he said to his mother, behold, Woman, behold your son. And he said to the disciple, this is John obviously, Behold your mother. From that hour the disciple took her into his own household. After this, knowing all things that had already been accomplished, to fulfill the scripture, he said, I am thirsty. A jar of sour wine was standing there, so they put a sponge full of sour wine upon a branch of hyssop and brought it near his mouth. Therefore, Jesus, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. He bowed his head and gave up his spirit. As we celebrated on Friday, Jesus hung on the cross as we behold Him on the cross, as we look upon our Savior upon the cross, remember the crucifixion was the cruelest of deaths. Uh, it was a cruel death for someone that was guilty of a murder, guilty of something heinous. It, it was a cruel death for even the worst of criminals. The pain of the nails being driven through in one's hands and their feet. The shame of hanging naked on the cross. Uh, with the reputation being, of being a criminal, the death itself was cruel because of the length of time it took to suffocate in one's own blood. But what does it all mean? Jesus died. When we say it, Jesus died on a cross. He hung on a cross. We, we say it, we, we see words of it, we see signs of it, we see memes of it, we see Jesus died on a cross for our sins. But often we don't act like this event was as momentous as it really was and is. I actually looked up online, found a historian who listed the most momentous events in world history. Uh, he named the Black Plague or the Bubonic Plague as one of them, the fall of Can uh, Constantinople. Uh, the American Revolution, the American Civil War was on the list. Uh, pr the Protestant Refor Reformation, Gutenberg's printing press, both World, War World Wars were on it. Uh, the most important, he said, was the French Revolution. I don't think any of us would say these were minor events, that they weren't important. But listen, there's only one event in human history that could change the destiny of mankind. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Only one. You want to talk about the most momentous events? Jesus dying and rising again from the grave. I know many of you could say what I say, accepting Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior was the most momentous event in my life. The most important event that's ever happened to me. And as you behold the man on the cross this morning, I hope you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Let me give sort of the counter side of that. I hope you don't look at Jesus as just a band-aid to cover up a few black marks on your your history, on your life. Uh, he's not here just to fix your boo-boos. I hope you've uh, not looked upon him as 
the one your parents and grandparents served, uh, but you uh, don't have much of a use for him. Uh, have you looked to Jesus uh, as the popular, popular religion in our area to follow? Or have you chosen Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord because he loves you and he died for you? I hope you will, if you haven't yet, I hope you will do that today and never turn away from him for your whole life. There's an old hymn that says, How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that he would give his only son to make a wretch his treasure. How great the pain of searing loss, the Father turned his face away, as wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory. Behold the man upon the cross, my sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed, I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath has brought, to, brought me life. I know that it is finished. I will not boast in anything, no gifts, no power, no wisdom, but I will boast in Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer, but this I know with all my heart. His wounds have paid my ransom. What should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer, but this I know with all my heart. His wounds have paid my ransom. Aren't you thankful for that? Behold the man at his trial. Behold the man on the cross, but also behold the man that rose from the grave. Again, we're in John. Turn over to chapter 20, verse 1. I'm going to read a lengthy passage. It's Easter. I believe we can handle it. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came early to the tomb while it was still dark and saw the stone already taken away from the tomb. So she ran and came to Simon Peter and the other disciple whom Jesus loved. Again, that's John. That's how he refers to himself. And said to them, they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter and the other disciple went forth and they were going to the tomb. The two were running together and the other disciple ran ahead faster than Peter and came to the tomb first. Then stooping and looking in, he saw the linen wrappings and lying there, but he did not go in. So Simon Peter also came following him and entered the tomb and he saw the linen wrappings lying there. And the face cloth, which had been on his head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in the place by itself. So the other disciple, who had come first to the tomb, also entered. He saw and believed. What did he believe? That Jesus had rose from the grave. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. So the disciples went away again to their own homes. But Mary was standing outside the tomb weeping, and so as she wept, she stooped and looked into the tomb and she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and one at the feet where the body of Jesus had been lying. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. And she did not know it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him. I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, I love this, just uttered her word, uttered her name, Mary. I remember when Jesus uttered my name, when he spoke to my heart. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher, Jesus said to her, Stop clinging to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I ascend to my Father and your Father and my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came, announcing to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And they have said, and that he had said these things to her. And when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, when they, the doors were shut, where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them both his hands and his side. The disciples then rejoiced when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. 
And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, their sins have been forgiven you. If you retain the sins of any, they have been retained. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, everybody know what that means? Twin. Was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples were saying to him, We have seen the Lord, but he said to them, Unless I see his hands, uh, in his hands the imprint of the nails and put my finger into the place of the nails and put my hand into his side I will not believe after eight days the disciples were again inside and Thomas with them Jesus came the doors had been shut and the, stood in their midst and said peace be with you and he said to Thomas reach here with your finger and see my hands and reach here with your hand and put it to my side and do not be unbelieving but believing Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God, Jesus said to him, Because you have seen me, have you believed? Blessed are those who do not see or did not see and yet believed. Jesus is talking about us, isn't he? We, don't, we didn't see Jesus on the cross. We didn't see him at his trial. We don't physically see him raised from the dead. But we believe Regardless of whether we have seen with our own eyes, we have seen, we believe because the Word of God teaches us that Jesus died. Did you know there are over 300 verses concerned with the subject of Jesus' resurrection in the New Testament? Now, there's a popular teaching with people that are uh, wiser than their intelligence level should give them that say now that they believe in Jesus, they believe the Scripture, but they don't believe the resurrection. Forget it. Don't placate it. Don't do it. Either Jesus is resurrected or He's a liar. 300 verses concerned with the subject of Jesus' resurrection in the New Testament. Let me give you some reasons that we should, that things that we see in Scripture. The resurrection of Jesus is a sign for unbelievers as well as the answer for the believer's doubt. The resurrection serves as a guarantee that Jesus' teachings are true and that He is the center of the, and it, the resurrection is the center of the gospel itself. The resurrection is a force for evangelism. It's a key for the believer's daily power to live the Christian life. It's the reason for the total commitment to Jesus in our lives. The resurrection addresses the fear of death and is concerned to the second coming of Jesus. The resurrection is a model of the Christian's resurrection from the dead one day in the future. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, the Christian faith is a foolish fantasy. However, if the resurrection of Christ did occur, it confirms His life, His message, and His atoning work. It is the basis of our hope of life beyond the grave. Jesus is alive, and the evidence is overwhelming. Here's some reasons we can be sure. Jesus predicted His resurrection. The Old Testament prophesied it. The tomb was empty. The grave clothes were vacant. And those who opposed Christ wished to silence His disciples. All they had to do was produce a body, but they never could find it. Many people saw the resurrected Christ. They looked on His face, they touched Him, they heard His voice, and even saw Him eat. 1 Corinthians 15, 6 says, After that He appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of who remain until now, but some have fallen asleep, Apostle Paul says. The lives of the disciples were revolutionized. Before that, they were weak, doubtful, and fearing. After the resurrection and they received the Holy Spirit, they were different men. They were brave. They followed Jesus all but one to the death. And he lived faithful life to Jesus till his death. The resurrection was the central message of the early church. The church grew with unwavering conviction that Christ had risen and was the Lord of the church. It, we have the only faith that even dares to proclaim that our founder rose from the dead. Men and women today testify that the power of the risen Christ has transformed their lives. We know that Jesus is alive not only because of His historical and biblical evidence, but also because He miraculously touched our lives. 
Again, one old hymn says, Rejoice, rejoice, O Christian, lift up your voice and sing eternal hallelujahs to Jesus Christ the King, the hope of all who seek Him, the help of all who find. None other is so loving, so good and kind. What is it? He lives, He lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, He lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know He lives. How? He lives within my heart. You see, the man that we behold that rose from the dead is the one who conquered sin, death, hell, and the grave. Because of that, you can be changed. You can be forgiven. You can have a home in heaven and even be given a pur purposeful life here. We also behold the man that is coming again. Turn with me one book over to the book of Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1 verse 9. We read of Jesus' ascension up to heaven. It says, after, these, after he had said these things, he was lifted up while they, the disciples, were looking on, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And as they were gazing intently into the sky while he was going, behold, two men in white clothing stood beside them. They also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? Listen to this. This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come again just the same way as you watched him go into heaven. You see, this Jesus that we behold at his trial, the Jesus that we beheld on the cross, this Jesus that we behold that rose from the grave, this Jesus is coming again as he ascended into heaven. He's coming again after us one day. You see, this is not all there is to life. This is just a very short part. We have eternity to live for. When we look at Jesus and we think of his ascension, we know that because of what these angels said, he's coming again. Because of what the Word of God teaches us, that he's coming again. Who is he coming after? He's coming back for those who are watching and waiting for him. Those that are living for him. When we read of Jesus' ascension up to heaven, we realize he finished his work. He went away so the Holy Spirit could come and live within us from the moment we're saved till we arrive in heaven. And I want to share a couple of verses with you, hopefully that share with, share with you who he's coming back for. Hebrews 9, 28. So Christ also, having been offered once for all to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin. Listen, to those who eagerly await Him. Do you eagerly await the coming of Jesus? I do. I can't wait. Matthew 24, verse 31. And He will send forth His angels with a great trumpet, and they will gather together His elect, that's the saved, from the four winds, from one end of the sky to the other. Mark 13, 33. Take heed. Keep on the alert. Be awake. Be aware. For you do not know when the appointed time will come. Luke 21, verse 34. Be on guard. There it is again. Be on guard. Be aware. So that your hearts will not be weighted down with dissipation and drunkenness and the worries of life. And that day will not come on you suddenly like a trap. In other words, be on guard because it's coming. For it, is, for it will come upon all those who dwell on the face of the earth, but keep on the alert at all times, praying that you may receive strength to escape all those things that are about to take place and to stand before the Son of Man, Jesus Himself. Yeah, we're going to behold Him another time. We're going to behold Him at judgment. 1 John 2, 28. Now little children, abide in Him, so that when He appears, we may have confidence and not shrink away from him in shame at his coming. My question to you is, if you heard the trump of God sound right now, would you shrink back? Would you be scared and nervous about his coming? Or would you be thrilled to know that he's coming after you? The Bible says that if you would call upon the name of the Lord, you, he would receive you if you would repent of your sins in faith. Lastly, behold the man that is speaking to your heart today. I want to share three short verses with you again. And this is a, as Stephen and the musicians come to, uh, to share with us a song of invitation. Behold the man that is speaking to your heart today. John 12, 32. And I, 
if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. That, that to me speaks to the whosoever will in Scripture. That if, you, if the Lord is speaking to your heart today and He's drawing you to Himself, that He will not turn you aside. He will welcome you into His forever family if you would just repent of your sins and surrender your life wholly to Him. Pastor, you don't know what I've done. I don't need to know what you've done. Jesus' blood is so powerful that it can atone for the sins of all mankind. John 6, 44 says, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up on the last day. Just a reminder that we have to be drawn by, by the Lord. In 1 Corinthians 2, 11, For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, the thoughts of God no one knows except the Spirit of God. God knows what you've done. God knows what I've done. And the Bible tells us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He said, well, I need to get some stuff straight, Pastor. I need to get some stuff cleaned up in my life. You can't. Only He can clean us up. He catches us. He cleans us. We cannot clean ourselves up. It's futile to try. You will never be worthy of the kingdom of heaven. You'll never be worthy. If you cleaned yourself up and you, you tried your hardest and you thought, this, I, I'm, I'm finally worthy of Jesus' death. Now you've got pride. That's worse than anything else because it, it certainly will separate you from the Lord. But if you're here today and the Lord has spoke to your heart, as the musicians come and as Stephen comes to sing a verse, if you would like to be saved today, I, I would implore you to come forward. There's no better day than to, to be saved than this day. Well, how do I be saved, Pastor? How do I do that? By praying and asking Jesus to forgive your sins. Saying, Lord, I want to live for you from this day forward. I, don't, I want to be in your family. I don't want to be apart from you today or especially for all of eternity. Stand, if you will. What number do we have, Stephen? 192. Have you failed in your plan of your storm-tossed life? Place your hand in the nail-scarred hand. Are you weary and worn from its toil and strife? Place your hand in the nail-scarred hand. Place your hand in the nail-scarred hand. Place your hand in the nail-scarred hand. He will keep to the end. He is your dearest friend. Place your hand in the nail-scarred hand.